All right. Good morning. Thank you all for uh, getting out of bed early. Um, and welcome to the uh, Dust and Black Carbon in the Cryosphere session. So we'll have oral sessions uh, this morning, and then we have posters tomorrow morning? Tomorrow afternoon, early afternoon. Um, so we're going to start off uh, with uh, our two invited, two of our invited talks, uh, the first from Ram Ramanathan and the next from Mark Flanner. Ram. Good morning. I, I'm happy to see as many people as I see here. I was begging my wife and daughter to come, and they said no. But in any case, I, I'm glad to see. Uh, yeah, just as an a opening remark, uh, I'm going to focus, although I put Arctic, I'm going to focus more on the Himalayas. And I personally think, uh, hopefully, I'll be able to persuade you the whole mountain glacier system in the Himalayas is probably the most vulnerable of all the systems, with the exception of the Arctic, and has received the least amount of attention. So let's just review what's going on. Uh, first is, this is a study by my graduate student, Christina. Clearly, the Arctic is darkening. I think we took the radiation budget measurements, more direct observations of what the, what's happening with the Arctic, this paper is under review, and hopefully, I think there's a reviewer three who is giving a problem. If you, if you are there, please <laughs> accept it. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, it's, it's, uh, when you look at the actual energy which has gone to the system, it's amazing. You can just see the clear sky darkening. These are actually real data. The second thing, which is, again, I think it to be one of the most uh, uh, interesting and alarming issue is that we find, this is a paper published uh, by my postdoc, Frida Bender, myself, and George Saliudis at GISS. The whole extratropical cloud systems is ret you know, retreating, not only the ice sheet. So what's interesting is that about 25 years ago, using the Earth radiation budget experiment, we said the cooling by clouds is primarily from these extratropical cloud systems. So their shrinking is not good for the polar oceans. So having said that, let me just uh, move to the so-called third pole. And uh, coming to the Himalayan glaciers, I myself became uh, aware of the full extent of the problem when teaming up with Paul Crutzen and Leonard Bengtsson. At the, we commissioned a meeting of the mountain glaciers in, uh, at the Vatican Academy of Science. I see uh, two members here who came to that meeting, our distinguished chairperson, and uh, uh, European glaciologist uh, Wilfred is also, I think, in the audience. So this really, I think, was one of the first time dominant focus was on the mountain glaciers. I was alarmed at the way the Alps has retreated. There was also some important data which was released, and the Vatican considers this as one of the most influential report they had published. And, uh, and we had a famous uh, Everest climber, David Brashears, and he documented as vivid pictures of various glaciers retreating. So this was uh, important. The reason I'm highlighting is, as you know, after the IPCC AR4, the whole thing about Himalayan glaciers became one of the most controversial issues. There were some uh, nonsensical forecasts which was made, and that made the dragged all of the good science. So this was important that this was an Indian glaciologist came and showed us one piece of data after the other. The Chota Shigri, the bottom one you see is remarkable pictures. We don't need data to show these glaciers are shrinking. But anyway, the red and the blue lines document. The key thing where it became a little bit controversial is that most of the retreat is in small and mid-sized glaciers, not the big ones. It's not that the big ones are not retreating. We don't have enough data, because you have to put the poles to look at the thickness. But clearly, the small glaciers, and now the Indian government does uh, agree with it, because he is a scientist from the Indian government who released that data. It's the first time this data was released at that Vatican meeting. Yep. Next one. So as you can see, this is uh, 
captured, this was about two, two three days after our meeting. Times of India got that, 75%. What was interesting is that the Chinese had already released similar information two, three years before most of the uh, Tibetan glaciers were retreating too. Okay. So let me just put the picture together, what's happening in the Himalayan region. Starting from the left-hand side, let me just see if this pointer works. First, of course, we, some of the retreat is definitely related to the recovering from the Little Ice Age. And uh, Wilfred in the Vatican meeting talked about it with the Alps, although there may be some questions about why exactly they are retreating. The second is the land degradation, the dust. And I have to put this on top, otherwise the chairman would throw me out by now. <laughs> we have the world's dust expert sitting here. So uh, that's on the top. The th of course, the dominant source of the warming there is the greenhouse gases, atmospheric warming. And that by itself would have led to more precipitation. You know, most of the central and eastern Himalayas, the source of moisture is during the summer monsoon, surprisingly. And uh, so that greenhouse warming is predicted to lead to more intense precipitation. That does not necessarily mean the water will be accumulating. Then comes this whole host of issues which have been focused in the last 10 years, the role of atmospheric pollution. Uh, first is the black and brown carbon issue. And I'm going to show you some data we collected with our unmanned aircraft directly on this. So what we found was that this was contributing as much as greenhouse gases to the CO2 warming, okay? Independent of what the black carbon does in the snow, I think we'll hear it from our next speaker. And then this brown cloud also cuts down sunlight going into the land and the ocean. We showed that would decrease precipitation, okay? So the source of moisture is choked, decreased. And the last is the deposition of the black carbon which causes localized heating. Okay, so all these processes are going on. Of course, what I don't show here is natural variability. That, of course, in that region is pretty big, if not dominant. So, but nevertheless, these levers are pulling this in one direction. So what is the evidence we have? This is one of the earlier papers by, again, by Chinese uh, scientists, and, and what they showed was that the warming both in the winter and annual, was increasing with altitude, okay? By the time you go to about five kilometers where the glaciers are sitting, the warming is about half a degree per decade. We're not talking about half a degree or a century, okay? It's almost two to three times the global warming. Clearly, I'll show you, you can't explain all of this from greenhouse warming. There are issues like moist lapse rate, which you could explain some of it, but not all of it. So the next one. <clears throat> so this was uh, the work, one of the first uh, piece of papers which came out from the Calypso data. This is in a paper Nature we published. And what we showed was the Everest, the whole Himalayan region is covered by brown clouds on both sides, okay? This could be uh, dust, Tom Painter sitting there. And these are Ramanathan's brown clouds. <laughs> so it's sort of surrounding it from both sides, okay? And we flew our aircraft in the Arabian Sea, three UAVs, first time stacked, across this brown cloud and directly measuring the heating with, with some of the most precise radiometers, yeah. So that shows the black carbon distribution and our measurements are heating and we quantified it in 10 source of heating in this latitude between one to three kilometers, okay? Then we brought in satellite data, put this all together, reconstructed the heating pattern from brown clouds over the entire Arabian Indian subcontinent. We teamed up with NCAR uh, scientists in the model. And this is the model prediction from just the black and CO2 and SO2. And then we put the black carbon. It's almost comparable in magnitude. And, and for those who talk about black carbon deposition on snow, don't get this confused with that. It has nothing to do with black carbon deposition. It's the entire tropical region. I mean, the Indian subcontinent air getting heated and the warm air then goes over the mountains and warms that. Let's go to the next one, please. So was there evidence for this? So we compared it with the 
teamed up with Chang Fu at the University of Washington, Seattle, that is microwave sounder reconstruction of the warming. This differential warming, difference between air and surface. By subtracting the surface, so we sort of took care of the lapse rate issue, and we find the GCMs with just greenhouse gases can't even come close. And this is our simulation with the brown clouds, this is with the sounder. Later, our work was confirmed by a group from Goddard, and they showed this warming. You see that you don't see the warming as much over there, it's more in the air, okay? Yeah. So the second is, I think Mark would show that, I didn't realize he was a speaker next to me, and it's basically their work, and he was kind enough to invite us to join the last minute. So this is their snow dust forcing, you'll see it. It's about 10 watts per meter squared. It's huge. For those of you who are not in this business, the greenhouse forcing is about two watts per meter squared. But it's not, it's kind of unfair to compare the two, but I'm just giving you the magnitude of the watts per meter squared. What does that mean? So this is as far as climate is concerned. Now let's go into the actual microphysics. Uh, this was a paper, you know, we wrote with Danny Rosenfeld. It was his reconstruction. What he showed, and I think this is the various regions in the Indo-X region where we were doing the RAB and C. This shows the effective radius of the particles, okay? And according to his work, you need about 20 to 15 micron before the cloud will start rain. And what he found was that in the polluted clouds, okay, you really have to go very deep before you hit this threshold of 15 micron. In the pristine region, you can see that even at low levels, sorry, interpret this temperature in terms of altitude. That's about one to four kilometers, and this is you have to go about five kilometers. So you have to go, the cloud has to get thicker before it'll start dropping water on you, okay? So what that means is that if you have polluted region, nature will figure out a way to rain because rain is controlled by dynamics, large-scale convergence. But the type of clouds which will rain is governed by microphysics. So the clouds have to be very thick before they'll rain, so the intensity of the rain goes up. So is there evidence for any of this? We had published our paper in 2005. There has been afterwards at least 20, 30, 40 papers on this issue of brown cloud, aerosols, and precipitation. But let's go into the data. This was published by the Indian meteorologists. And clearly what they showed, most regions in India, moderate rainfall is decreasing, large-scale precipitation, which is what recharges groundwater, but the intense rainfall is increasing. Mind you, the greenhouse gas warming will also give heavy precipitation increasing, but it won't give you moderate decreasing. Either it has to be natural variability or aerosols. They're the only two things which can explain that. And then going into the mountains, you have both precipitation decreasing. So clearly, a source of moisture for the central and eastern Himalayas is also decreasing, okay? So how do we get out of this mess? And of course, the obvious thing, first thing we should do is cut down CO2. And it's been obvious to us scientists for the last three decades but politically, it seems to be a Herculean task. So should we wait, or can we do something else? So it turns out, you know, in 2008, using the IPC results I had shown, we have already put enough greenhouse gases to heat the planet by two and a half degrees. So once there are enough greenhouse, the only way we can cut the warming is, if you think of the greenhouse gas as a blanket, shrink that blanket. So and we found the way to do that is short-lived climate pollutants. I'm a, I'm a time up, or I have a few minutes left? Uh, your, your time is up, but okay. we have, we're going to allow a little slip because the, at 9 o'clock, that talk has been withdrawn. Oh, thank you. I made that happen. <laughs> so these are the short-lived pollutants, and they contribute as much as 40% to the current global warming. It's a well known hidden secret amongst the experts. We think of this as a CO2 problem. It is, but there are 40%. Go ahead. So we showed in 2010 a paper in which, you know, if you just rely on CO2 mitigation, we will hit past two degrees. Not end of the century, another 40 years. And the way to keep that under control 
is to bring down the short-lived climate pollutants, and they keep the thing under the two-degree threshold. And later, UNEP commissioned a huge international panel, and they basically reproduced our work. That that's the, with the CO2 mitigation, you need both CO2 and the SLCPs. I'm not saying CO2 is not necessary, but you need both. The measures to cut down these pollutants are all local measures. You know, I myself is focusing on the cook stoves, about a third of the 25-30% of the total black carbon emissions comes from this residential combustion, or three billion still depend on this. So that's, you know, I'm working in this region the Himalayas. You can see the woman cooking. The same woman was there inside that house, and you can see the smoke. Let's go, yeah. So that smoke spread like that. I mean, the, the now isotope chemists from Sweden have confirmed our work that about 60% of that brown cloud is coming from residential combustion, biomass burning. Let's go. So the co-benefits are also huge. You avoid about 3 million deaths and prevent millions of tons of crops. My postdoc yesterday presented how about, about 20 million tons of crops are destroyed in India alone from these brown clouds. So let me just conclude with the science issues. What's not been realized, this is a series of papers we had published, but experimentalists knew about this all along. Chemists knew about this. In addition to black carbon, there is brown carbon, what we call organic cooling. It turns out it's not that white after all. It's a large source of absorption. And there were two papers we had shown this. So that has to be included in all of our analysis, brown carbon. The key is the dust brown carbon mixtures. This is a postdoc in my lab who is making, doing this. Uh, images and making calculations, that's mineral dust aged with carbon. And that is pure mineral dust. It's huge impact. So the dust, black carbon. This is where I started working with Mr. Dust here. I thought dust can't play a role in climate change. It turns out it can, even if the dust didn't change. The black carbon is changing, and the dust black carbon mixtures could do cruel things to the heating pattern. So I think given the time, I'm going to skip this. This is issues of how dust has a huge impact on mid-atmosphere heating rate. We don't find the Arabian sea dust particularly strong absorber. OK, we have to understand chemically. Thank you. So just in the interest of time, we'll, we'll look for that 9 to 9.15 slot for uh, questions for all of our speakers. Thank you, Ron. Okay, next, Mark Flanner. Okay, thanks. Uh, Ram gave a very nice overview of the relevant issues, and this talk will focus more on the uh, influence of black carbon in the Arctic on local climate. Okay, uh, motivation for exploring this topic comes from uh, recognition that the Arctic is warming quite rapidly. We see over the last 30 years that uh, warming has been several fold greater in the Arctic than in the global mean. Uh, meanwhile, September minimum sea ice extent has declined by about half since 1979. Um, and uh, recognition of these rapid climate changes uh, motivates uh, a desire to explore uh, mitigation opportunities to arrest the, uh, the rapid climate change that we've, that we've been seeing. Okay, so why the interest in black carbon? Well, um, this comes from a couple of different uh, features. First of all, black carbon warms, and it's also short-lived, which indicates potential for rapid mitigation. So we see uh, radiative forcing from the IPCC report. We've got carbon dioxide here. Uh, and a breakdown of the aerosol contributions to radiative forcing in the right plot. And um, in theory, if we were to halt all black carbon emissions today, this forcing would drop to zero within, uh, within a few weeks. And we can contrast that with CO2. If magically we were to halt CO2 emissions today, this forcing would stay put, and it would gradually decline 
uh, over the next 100 years or so. Um, so there's potential for rapid mitigation through aerosol species. Um, the fact that this persists for a long time is also why it's sort of the 800-pound gorilla uh, over the century time scale. Complications associated with mitigation through black carbon originate from the fact that black carbon is co-emitted with species which cool. If we were to reduce black carbon, we would also reduce the cooling effect from organic carbon aerosol species, uh, and also cloud indirect effects, which are very difficult to, to model. Um, what you don't gather from the global mean plots is, um, is a unique vulnerability to positive radiative forcing from black carbon in the Arctic region. And we can see this visually in satellite images, such as the one on the left, which indicate that um, uh, you can see where smoke is lofted over highly reflective surfaces. It causes an increase in column solar energy absorption. And where the same smoke is lofted over darker surfaces, it appears bright against the background and contributes to uh, an increase in reflected solar radiation to space. And this is the reason why total direct radiative forcing from aerosol species is positive over high latitude regions and is negative over the rest of the rest of the planet. Okay, and the second reason why the Arctic is uniquely vulnerable to positive forcing occurs from deposition of, of uh, light absorbing species, including black carbon and dust. So here we see the spectral albedos of snow with and without uh, black carbon. And um, extremely small concentrations of black carbon are capable of reducing snow albedo because of multiple scattering in the snowpack and because the absorptivity of, of black carbon is, is many fold, many uh, orders of magnitude greater than, than that of ice. Uh, and a third reason is that black carbon can persist longer in near surface snow than it can in the atmosphere and maybe sort of extend that two week time frame that I referred to at the beginning of the talk for reducing forcing from, from black carbon. Okay, so we recognize that the Arctic is uniquely vulnerable to positive radiative forcing uh, from light absorbing species, uh, but the local climate response can be more complicated, and that's really the, uh, I guess, the topic or the motivation for this study. Um, the first indication that the Arctic climate response to uh, radiative forcing, uh, first uh, indication that this may be quite complicated, came from a paper from Schindel and Fluvigi in 2009 where they actually showed that the Arctic surface cools in response to forcing from atmospheric black carbon. Uh, and that's indicated here, the 60 to 90 degree response to radiative forcing exerted between 60 and 90. Uh, and the reasons why this occurred is because of the surface dimming effect where there's a reduction in surface incident uh, solar radiation. And then secondly, there's reduced poleward heat flux into the Arctic caused by heating that only occurs within the Arctic, Arctic atmosphere. Okay, this is just from atmospheric BC. This does not include the uh, snow and ice deposited black carbon. And so, um, in contrast to that, some work that I and others have done have shown uh, using GCM simulations that the high latitudes warm strongly in response to uh, global black carbon in snow radiative forcing. And here we see an equilibrium temperature response. This is not the Arctic forcing, but rather the global forcing from uh, BC and snow. There's a very large efficacy factor, the temperature response to forcing ratio. This is caused by several reasons, uh, including the fact that all of the forcing energy is deposited directly into the cryosphere. And then a point that's particularly relevant for high latitudes like the Arctic is that the energy is deposited into the surface. Um, and this is important where we have stable atmospheric conditions which um, sort of trap the energy forcing into the lower part of the atmosphere or the surface environment. Okay, so we recognize several effects of light absorbing aerosols in the Arctic. We have atmospheric heating through solar absorption. We have surface dimming, reduction in surface incident uh, insulation. We have surface darkening from cryosphere deposited aerosols. We have increased atmospheric stability caused by warming aloft and cooling at the surface, which decreases the atmospheric lapse rate. Uh, we have increased low cloud cover through a semi-direct effect, which I'll talk about uh, in a minute. And we have reduced poleward heat flux caused by a reduction in the latitudinal temperature gradient, uh, again caused by uh, heating that occurs only in the Arctic environment. And we also have some coupled hydrological feedbacks associated with sea ice, snow, and water vapor, which I'll ta also talk about in a second. 
So recognition of these, uh, of these different effects in the Arctic motivates a desire to explore the dependency of Arctic climate sensitivity on, first of all, the altitude and the season of black carbon radiative forcing in the Arctic, secondly, atmospheric versus cryospheric forcing in the Arctic, and thirdly, black carbon forcing exerted both within and outside of the Arctic. The um, reason why this is particularly relevant, especially exploration of the dependency of altitude and season, is that uh, sources enter the Arctic at different altitudes. They have different likelihood of depositing to snow and sea ice surfaces, and they are emitted during different seasons. And uh, we, there are two basic transport mechanisms for aerosols to reach the Arctic. Uh, emissions that occur inside of the polar vortex, inside of the dome, are more likely to uh, mix evenly in the lower troposphere and are much more likely to deposit within the Arctic. Long-range emissions, which occur outside of the dome, are capable of being transported to the Arctic, uh, generally along ice and tropic surfaces, which rise uh, with increasing latitude. And these, uh, these sources are more likely to enter the Arctic at a much higher altitude. Okay, so we explore this through a series of equilibrium uh, climate simulations conducted with the NCAR Community Earth System model uh, using the slab ocean models. We impose highly idealized radiative forcings in certain locations and seasons. And these uh, radiative forcings are achieved through fixed absorption, opt, uh, aerosol absorption optical depths, which uh, result in radiative forcings that are on the order of one watt per square meter in the Arctic. Okay, and so here's a, a table of the first set of experiments where we, dis, where we explore the, um, the, the dependence on, of surface temperature response on the altitude of black carbon forcing in the Arctic. Again, uniform aerosol absorption optical depth. And we also have an experiment where we just put black carbon in the surface, snow and sea ice layer, uh, sea ice layer within the Arctic. Okay, and here's a, uh, uh, an image depicting the seasonal and altitudinal distribution of equilibrium temperature response within the Arctic. We see that when we put black carbon at high altitude, in this case 227 mill millibars or uh, uh, very near or within the Arctic stratosphere, we get very strong heating at that altitude, but we actually see cooling at the surface. So this heat is, is not uh, being, this energy is not being propagated to the Arctic surface environment. So we see a strong signal of heating Actually, wherever the black carbon uh, is, is located, the heating is, is constrained to, uh, uh, the strong heating is, occurs where, uh, where we put the black carbon, and also during the summer months where we have insulation um, so that the, black carbon, that the black carbon is absorbing. Okay, we also see, um, so we see actually surface cooling with black carbon located near, this, near the tropopause. We see very, very strong surface warming when the black carbon is located in the Arctic boundary layer or when the black carbon is located in the snow and sea ice. Uh, we actually see very strong sensitivities. In the case with, uh, with boundary layer black carbon, we observed a, a sensitivity of about 2.8 kelvins per watt per square meter locally within the Arctic. Okay, uh, we also see this uh, feature of rather strong winter warming in several experiments, and this is a bit more challenging to, uh, to explain. So we're going to explore that a little bit in the next few slides. Um, we also see decreased cloud cover that occurs within the layer of heating, and that's caused by a reduction in relative humidity. This is a well-known sort of burn-off effect. Um, we don't see it in the stratospheric case, but we see a reduction in cloud cover uh, with BC located about 450 millibars, again a reduction in cloud cover here and here, and we see an increase in cloud cover beneath the layer of atmospheric heating, um, and this is caused by an increase in stability which favors uh, cloud condensation. Okay, so this is uh, the well-known semi-direct effect of, uh, of black carbon-induced heating uh, and other aerosol-induced effects. And we see this low cloud burn-off when we have black carbon in the boundary layer. And reduction in summer clouds contributes to heating. And this increase in winter clouds also contribute to, uh, to heating. So this is... Uh, a result of the, the fact that Arctic clouds cool during summer when we have insulation, and the clouds uh, warm during winter through long wave effects uh, when we don't have the compensating cooling effect. So this reduction in low-level clouds, uh, low-level cloud burn-off in the boundary layer case was one of the reasons why we saw very 
uh, very strong warming in this case. Okay, uh, I should say, but in the other experiments, uh, the increase in, in low-level clouds that we see here help offset some of, the, uh, some of the heating effect, and these help explain why we saw very weak warming with higher altitude black carbon. Okay, if we look at the water vapor response, um, we again see very uh, substantial increases in Arctic water vapor content when, when we have black carbon located in the lower, uh, the lower atmospheric environment or, or deposited to snow and sea ice. And so we get increased water vapor uh, caused by atmospheric warming, which uh, allows for an e equilibrium uh, increase in, in water vapor content, and also decreased sea ice cover, which permits greater evaporation. So we have propagating sea ice, water vapor, and cloud anomalies that contribute to early winter warming in some of these experiments. We can see this by looking at the distribution of sea ice extent. Um, on the right, we have uh, uh, the equilibrium change in, in sea ice extent. We have very large reductions in autumn sea ice extent. When we have black carbon located in the snow and the sea ice, shown here with the red curve, and also uh, when, especially when the black carbon is located in the, in the Arctic boundary layer, we have large reduction in September sea ice extent. But we also see that sea ice largely recovers to midwinter, uh, recovers by midwinter in, in all of these experiments. And um, this is why we have strong warming during early winter and, uh, and weaker warming during late winter. Okay, uh, how much time do we have, Tom? All right. Okay, secondly, we have seasonally varying black carbon experiments. And just to cut to the chase here, we have decreasing forcing per unit mass of black carbon in the Arctic with progression of, uh, of spring to summer to fall. This is caused by the very high surface reflectance during April and May before the onset of, of melt. And we have decreasing insulation as the summer progresses. We can contrast that with increasing efficacy as the summer progresses, and this is caused by a uh, reduction in atmospheric stability, which allows radiative forcings to propagate more effectively to the surface. And this means that the mass normalized response show actually, uh, shown here actually shows very little variability with season. Okay, black carbon in all cases increases moist static energy of the atmosphere, and it decreases meridional energy transport into the Arctic. So this is a negative feedback on local forcing, is a decrease in meridional energy transport into the Arctic, again caused by reduction in latitudinal temperature gradient. Okay, and then finally we have um, an exploration of prognostic black carbon forcing operating both within and outside of the Arctic. Um, we recognize the importance of vertical distribution of black carbon, given the sensitivity experiments that I just showed. Here's an actual simulated profile of black carbon in the Arctic, and we can use measurements to constrain this. And I'm going to put up a few points here. Black carbon, uh, the surface cools when we have black carbon emissions operating only within the Arctic atmosphere. But the surface warms quite strongly, in fact, when we have black carbon emissions that operate both in the atmosphere and the snowpack. The surface warms when we have black carbon emissions operating only in the extra Arctic envir uh, environment. And this is caused by an increase in meridional energy transport into the Arctic. Black carbon forcing in the extra Arctic environment uh, increases the latitudinal temperature gradient, and this is conducive to, uh, this favors an increase in energy transport into the Arctic. Okay. Uh, so my conclusions are that Arctic near-surface and cryosphere-deposited black carbon cause strong warming, surface warming, because of snow, sea ice, and cloud feedbacks. Secondly, black carbon at higher altitudes causes weak warming or even cooling because of stable atmospheric conditions in the Arctic, surface dimming, reduced poleward heat flux, and an increased low-level clouds. Uh, thirdly, mid-latitude black carbon forcing warms the Arctic surface through increased meridional energy transport. And then finally, variation in mass normalized Arctic response with season is quite small. Thank you. Okay, thanks. We'll do okay. questions. Sounds good. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. All right, so next, Tom Breider. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the contribution of all the co-authors to this work. Uh, there's lots of people who have made valuable contributions. So um, 
Loretta Mickley, Danielle Jacob, Chow Chow Wang, um, Jenny Fisher, who now at the University of Wollongong in Australia, Melissa Payer, Eric Leiblandsberger, Shannon Koplitz, Rachel Chang, Becky Alexander. Um, and I'd also like to thank some people who I've had very interesting discussions with who've, who've helped towards the work, which is Cameron McNaughton, Paul Hazel, Aaron Van Donkelaar, and um, Antti Hervinen. Okay, well, let's jump straight into this. If we see, here we go. Right, so I'm going to give a similar idea to what we've seen on previous slides, but with a different figure this time. So the Arctic's very much a region in transition, um, and we've observed this. The top figure here shows a plot from a paper by Schindelatal in 2009. And what we can see here is, as the global average temperature has warmed, the, temp the temperature shift in the Arctic region, the 60 to 90 degree north region, has warmed much faster. Um, and in the last 30 years, since we've had satellites measuring the sea ice extent over the Arctic, we've also seen quite remarkable drops in the sea ice coverage over the Arctic. So um, you see there the 1980 to 2000 average sea ice extent um, over the period June to October, and you can see the sea ice extent in 2007 and 2012. And this has been a substantial loss in sea ice. And a real key question for, um, I suppose, us, us to understand as a community is what processes are driving these observed trends. And we really need to understand these processes if we are to make reliable future predictions for the, for the climate of the region. Okay, so there are many different factors that can be contributing to um, Arctic warming. Um, and in this work, I'm just going to talk about one of them potential factors, which is the contribution from near-term climate forcing agents. So by that, we mean aerosols and ozone forcing. And this is a figure from a paper by Quinatal in 2008 that nicely summarizes the key interactions that we're interested in. So we have scattering of shortwave radiation by aerosols. Um, the aerosols also provide a, cloud, uh, provide a source of cloud condensation nuclei um, and ice nuclei um, that can uh, change the cloud properties, such as the cloud albedo and the precipitation efficiency. Then we then have um, absorption of radiation by the absorbing aerosol components, such as black carbon, organic carbon and dust, and also ozone absorbs radiation. Um, just to say here, I'm going to, um, when I talk about absorption by organic carbon, the absorbing fraction of the organic carbon is what's called brown carbon. I noticed the first speaker mentioned this. So um, not all organic carbon absorbed, it's the brown carbon fraction that we're interested in. Um, and final interaction is this deposition to snow and ice of these absorbing species. Um, and what's key in the Arctic is because of the low solar elevation and the high surface albedo, you get multiple scattering and absorption that acts to amplify these interactions. Okay, so um, in, this, in this study we're using a chemical transport model called GeosChem. So this is not a climate model. It doesn't calculate its own wind and temperature fields. It's driven by GEOS5 meteorology, um, and we run it at 2 by 2.5 degree horizontal resolution. And we're using anthropogenic black carbon and organic carbon emissions for the year 2000 from uh, the Bond et al. 2007 inventory. We apply scaling factors in Russia and China to account for economic growth in these regions over the period 2000 to 2008. I should say my simulations here are for the year 2008. Um, and and these, are, these scaling factors are constrained to surface observations over Russia and China. And then we're also using six hourly open fire emissions from the Flambe um, fire emission inventory. And again, we apply scaling factors here to, because um, based on our um, looking at Arctas, which was an aircraft campaign run by NASA in the spring and summer of 2008 over the Arctic, um, we found the inventory was too high. So we scaled down the emissions here over Russia and also over Southeast Asia. Okay, so um, I want to kind of take you back in time to 2008. And um, to hear this is a plot of... Um, observed, the blue line observed black carbon concentrations in the atmosphere at the surface at Barrow in northern Alaska, and uh, the blue line is the observations, and this kind of whole ad hoc of um, sort of grey lines is the model simulations, and, and really the key thing is back in 2008 we didn't do a very good job of capturing the, um, the observed seasonality in the black carbon, and, and this was a problem for the community, we need, we need to better understand what's driving this seasonality and, and better incorporate it into our, into our models. So if we zip forward in time, to um, this is a comparison Barrow again for the year 2008. 
Uh, the black lines are the observations. The error bars indicate standard deviation in the interannual mean for 2000 to 2010. Um, and then the colored part of the chart indicates the simulated black carbon. Um, and what I've done here is I've broken this down into the anthropogenic and the open fire contributions. So you can see the seasonality in the two contributions. Um, the key thing, I suppose, here is we now can resolve the seasonal cycle. We don't quite resolve the magnitude of the peak in the winter. Um, but you can see this, this maxima that's observed in, the, kind of in February is almost entirely driven by anthropogenic sources. And um, what we've shown in previous work is that this is mainly sources in Russia that are efficiently transported across the Arctic to Barrow, um, and, um, yes, in the wintertime. So, okay, and then I'm going to skip across the Arctic here to Palas, which is in northern Finland. Again, you can see the um, observations here, and then you see the simulated. The model does a, does a, does a pretty good job here. It's, you can see on the Eurasian side of the Arctic, we have a larger contribution from anthropogenic sources. Um, the seasonality in the fires is quite similar with the peak in spring. Um, and if we can give a pan-Arctic perspective here, so the top figure here on the right shows the simulated surface BC in spring, um, and you can see how it's elevated over the Eurasian Arctic. I should use the pointer, shouldn't I? There you go. Here we go. I forgot this was here. Over the Eurasian Arctic, and then you can see these concentrations decline as the black carbon at the surface deposits to the surface as it moves across. Um, and then this kind of puts the Barrow observation and the Palace station in context. And if we move to the summer, uh, we see much lower concentrations in black carbon at the surface over the high Arctic. Uh, we see these kind of uh, fire sources here in Eurasia and North America and in Russia. And um, what, one thing to notice here is in the summertime, you see much steeper gradients in the black carbon concentrations, which is more efficient removal because we have more precipitation. So there's, there's more precipitation along the transport trajectories that's removing the black carbon. Um, and there's also much more, less efficient and slower transport as well. So... Okay, right, so as we know, the atmosphere is not two-dimensional, it's three-dimensional, and the surface is only part of the problem. And um, this here shows a com comparison with um, DC-8 observations, which were taken as part of the NASA Arctas campaign in two the spring and summer of 2008. So the spring campaign took place in, um, in Alaska, and the summer campaign was over Western Canada. So here I'm showing the red lines are... Um, the spring campaign and the black lines are the summer campaign. The circles, the red circles are for the observations and the squares, the dashed line with the squares is the model. So we, we seem to do for black carbon, we seem to resolve this, the, the transition. So you see you have higher concentrations in the springtime and then in the summer these decrease. And we get also this peak in black carbon in the mid, kind of at four to six kilometers in the middle Atmosphere, middle troposphere, um, and this peak is driven by a combination of anthropogenic sources in, in, in um, Asia and Russian fire sources. So these anthropogenic sources, these are emitted outside, Mark showed this plot with the polar dome, so these sources are emitted south of the polar dome and then they're transported and uplifted in what we call warm conveyor belts, which are associated with frontal systems off the coast of, of Asia, and these are uplifted and they enter the Arctic at altitude. Um, so that explains the peak here. And I also have um, a comparison for dust. On the, uh, sorry, not dust, OC on the right. And then the bottom figure here shows the comparison for dust. So um, what we see is, I suppose, the first thing you can take here is the model underestimates the dust observations in the summertime. This is, I think this is an underestimate in the North American dust source. So we seem to have some dust emissions coming off the Great Plain regions, maybe associated with agricultural activity that we don't, do a good job of accounting for at the moment in the model. Um, in the springtime, you see you get the dust increases with height into the, upper tro into the upper troposphere. And what's interesting is in the model, and I must stress this is a model result at the moment, but we find the dust is coming from the Sahara. I mean, a lot of people talk about transport of dust from, from Asian sources, but certainly in the simulation, it's from the Sahara. I mean, this does need an observational constraint. So if anyone has any views on if they think this is absolute rubbish or if they think this is a possibility, I'd be very interested to talk to you about this. Um, okay, one more thing I'd like to point out is in, in the Art Task field campaign, it was controversial as to whether there was an anthropogenic source in the springtime. And, and what we can see here is you've noticed the decrease in BC between the spring and the summer is much larger than that for OC. And we infer that as a evidence for an anthropogenic source in the spring during Art Task. 
Okay, right, so moving along to aerosol optical depth. Here I'm, um, the plot on the left here shows um, simulated and observed aerosol optical depth at eight aeronet sites north of 65 degrees north. Um, this is averaged across the different stations. The black line here shows the observed AOD, um, and then the coloured, I've broken down the, the simulated AOD into the contribution from the different components. So sulfate in blue, black carbon, organic carbon, dust, and sea salt. Um, and the white line here indicates when I switch off anthropogenic sources. So you can see here the kind of the natural, sim, the natural simulated AOD. Um, I'm just going to show, put, these, put this in context at the surface here. These are the locations of the stations. This is the summertime. And you can see the model seems to capture the spatial pattern. I mean, we're still very, very, we could do with more stations. I mean, there are more stations now, but um, back in 2008, there's a fewer. Okay. So I'd now like to talk about absorption AOD. Um, and for this, what we do is we take the simulated mass concentration in the model and then we apply mass absorption efficiency. For here, I'm using values of 9.5 for black carbon and 0.27 for organic carbon. And these are constrained from Arctas observations. And then I'm using a dust value of 0.03 meter squared per gram. This is constrained from the East Air aircraft campaign over Asia. Um, Okay, and this here sent shows the seasonality in the AOD as a mean over the Arctic. This isn't just at the eight stations. This is over the whole Arctic region. Um, and what you can see here is the contributions from black carbon, organic carbon, and dust. And we see the black carbon is dominant, um, but the, org the organic carbon and the dust contributions are not insignificant. These are also... These are also um, quite substantial. So, and again, the white line here shows the natural source. So when I switch off the anthropogenic sources, and you can see you get the largest anthropogenic contribution in the winter time and the spring time, and then again in the fall, but the summer time, really it's natural sources that are dominating the AOD, the AAOD, sorry. Um, and this is really natural source from fires. So this is open fire sources. Something I should say is all fires in this work we're assuming are natural. I mean, as we know, many fires are associated with anthropogenic agricultural activity. So, okay. So this is the, so the AAOD. I'm just going to show the deposition flux to the surface. Here, this is an equivalent grams of black carbon per meter squared per month, again, over the Arctic region. And this shows, um, I suppose it's similar to the AAOD. Um, I only calculate a, a deposition to the surface if the surface is covered in land ice, sea ice, or has a snow depth of greater than, than five centimetres in any given month. And, and really this is, I mean, we, we don't do any modelling of the radiative impact in snow or anything, but this is just to, so you can compare the relative contributions of the different, different fluxes. So again, black carbon's dominant, but the OC and the dust is also significant. Okay, and these are the, these are the key points for the two slides. So open fires, we actually find with the dominant source of AAOD and deposition in spring and summer of 2008. And then this quantifies the percentage contributions from the non-BC fraction. Right, so I'd like to finish just by talking about a decadal trend simulation that we're going to do. We're going to run the model from 1980 to 2010. Um, using these, we're going to use different meteorological fields from the MERA Mera fields, and we're going to run a slightly coarser resolution here at 4 by 5 degrees horizontal. We use GFED 3 fire emissions, and again, anthropogenic emissions from black carbon and from OC and BC. Um, and these are some preliminary results that show the simulated Arctic burdens for black carbon and organic carbon over the period 1997 to 2010. So this is the, the GFED 3 database, and you can see here the... BC in the top panel, the black is the spring, and the summer is the blue, and then OC at the bottom. And, and one thing we find is actually during spring 2008, which is when we have a, a very detailed and intensive observations of the Arctic, this was the highest BC and OC burdens over the entire 97 to 2010 period um, for both OC and BC. In the summer, the burdens were actually 50% lower than this 1997-2010 than this average. But I want to stress that this, um, these GFED-3 emissions, I mean, I've seen talks earlier in the week that say these are probably underestimated. So this is subject to a correction in the, the fire emissions. Okay, so uh, these are the summary and the um, conclusions of the work. So we have a large contribution from non-BC aerosol to spring and summer AAOD and deposition to the snowpack. Open fires were the dominant source of Arctic AOD um, in 2008 and deposition. And um, 
2008 BC and OC burdens were high in spring and low in summer relative to the period 1997 to 2010, but subject to the correction. Okay, that's it. Great. Thank you. And so you have thirteen. Okay. And then two, and yep. then a little extra. And can I get further? Right. Yeah. Where's it going? Okay. Okay. Good morning. Uh, so I'll be presenting some observational work that we that's based on uh, some uh, research we were doing on snow dome on Mount Olympus in Washington State in August of this year. So uh, most of you are familiar with this, um, but what we're interested in is looking at absorbing impurities on snow. And so these can include dust, or it can include black, black carbon, um, which we see different sources here. We have in, in industry, um, shipping is a big component of it, transportation. And then here's a picture of the Table Mountain fire that we had upstream of where I live this year, and um, definitely strongly impacts the air quality. Um, so black carbon is the big one. Um, dust, as, as um, Mackenzie and Tom know well, can also be very important depending upon the region. Um, and then organics and volcanic ash. Um, and here we have um, a couple pictures then uh, showing black carbon deposited on snow and how it reduces albedo, and here the same with dust. And so um, as has been already covered in this session, um, these absorbing impurities can, can really affect both climate and water resources um, by reducing the albedo and then also leading to accelerated melt. So here, once again, pictures of absorbing impurities on snow, reducing the albedo, and then here's work um, from Tom Painter um, showing that dust deposition has the potential to really uh, substantially change both the magnitude and the timing of runoff. Um, so if we look at how, uh, in this case I'm focusing on black carbon, but if we look at over here on the left, trends in black carbon since 1875 to 2000, we see that, of course, there's been a very large increase globally, but that these emissions really vary regionally. And here we can see for 1996 a spatial, um, uh, the spatial pattern of this. And so a question that needs to be asked then is why are we looking at this in the, in the Pacific Northwest? So the vast majority of this work is being done in the Himalaya region and in the Arctic. And most of my research up to this point has focused on this topic um, in the Himalayas and in the Tibetan Plateau. But there's a few important reasons why this should be being looked at in regions outside of, of these two main areas that are getting most of, of the community's focus. Um, and so I, in particular, am looking at this in, in uh, the glaciated regions of the Pacific Northwest. And so for mid-latitude regions in North America, this is where the vast majority of our mountain glaciers reside. Um, the snowpack and the glaciers in this region are maritime, so they're already um, fairly warm. So it doesn't take a lot of extra energy being added to the snowpack to change the, the snow from being fr frozen in snow to um, passing that melting point and, and getting more rapid runoff. Um, these regions are also uh, low elevation compared to where most of my work has been in the Himalaya where we're working at above 6,000 meters. Um, where we're working in Washington state is often at 1,000 meters or so. And so the, uh, these sources are a lot, uh, these mountain regions where the snowpack and the glaciers reside are a lot closer to these sources. Um, and then lastly, if we look here, so I'm, I'm working right now in the Pacific Northwest, you can see when you look at, at what the emission strength is, that the emission strength is fairly low in the Pacific Northwest. Um, but another reason I've been interested in this problem more locally is that this region lies downwind of major emission sources here. And um, prior research, researchers have documented um, the trans-Pacific transport of other pollutants. Um, so we know that what's being emitted from these real hot spot sources can get transported across to the Pacific. Whether or not they're important um, in this context compared to more regional sources, um, I think is still something we need to look into in more detail. 
So if we look at what's been happening with the cryosphere in the Pacific Northwest, this is a plot from Mari Pelto um, from 2008 showing um, change in the mass balance of glaciers from 1984 to 2006, showing a clear increase. And this is work from Moat showing the linear trend in the April 1st um, snow water equivalent um, that has shown a clear trend that there's been a decrease in the amount of snow stored in the snowpack at, at April 1st, which is, about, is typically peak SWE. And so this trend um, has largely been attributed to uh, rising temperatures. Um, but as most of us in this session are well aware, absorbing impurities are another factor that can be driving this. And so this is a picture that one of my previous students, Matt Jenkins, had, t had taken that I think demonstrates this well. Um, he had gone hiking in the morning, and these are his footprints. And when he returned later in that day, you can see the differential melt that happened just over several hours. And what we're looking at here isn't, you know, th th there's a fair bit of organics here. But I think this, this really clearly demonstrates how effective these absorbing impurities can be at, at um, absorbing energy and accelerating melt. And so I like this quote from Hansen and Nazarenko. We suggest that soot contributes to near worldwide melting of ice that is usually attributed so solely to global warming. So <clears throat> I think there's a lot of work that's been done to this point, but we still have more to do in terms of assessing how much of this perturbation to the, um, to the melt cycle is coming from these absorbing impurities. So there hasn't been a lot of work that's been done in the Pacific Northwest. This is modeling work that was done by Yun Xin, um, showing uh, black carbon deposition, where you see these real hot spots um, associated with the urban centers, Seattle and Portland being here. And his model showed that we would expect to see a change in the snow water equivalent um, with a reduction in the spring snowpack and also a shift to earlier melt. And so there, isn't, uh, there hasn't been a lot of observational work done, though, on this topic. And so over the last few years, myself and my students have been collecting samples from around Washington State. So for the last three years, we've, um, on a weekly to biweekly basis, we've been um, sampling the snowpack at Blue Up Pass, which isn't too far from where we live. And then um, during this past summer, um, Ian Delaney has been doing a lot of work in collaboration with the National Park Surface Glacier Monitoring Group to get um, snow and density core samples off of these glaciers around the North Cascades, the Emmons and Nisqually glaciers on Mount Rainier, and then I'm going to be presenting work here from Snow Dome out on Mount Olympus. And originally, we were really interested in working on Mount Olympus because this area here is upwind of where the major sources are from the urban area around Puget Sound. So we thought that this was going to kind of provide us the natural background of black carbon and dust and that we would be able to see more here the impacts of, of the large popu population center activities here. And Ian will have a poster tomorrow morning in the snow and, and dust session. And so of the work that's been done previously, this is, this, um, there hasn't been much looking at dust and snow, so this here is specific to black carbon. Um, this is work that has been um, done in the Pacific Northwest, but here we're looking at Blue It Pass, our work over the last three, uh, last three winters, showing black carbon concentrations measure, measured with the SP2, and concentrations aren't particularly high. The maximum that we've seen has been about 18.1. Um, earlier work by Clark and Noon um, was showing about similar here. And then here's just a summary of, uh, of some of the results from Ian's work, which is showing that during the winter time, concentrations are quite low, and I'll expand on this in a minute, whereas during um, the summertime, we see a real increase, and I'll address that in more detail here. So um, this is a picture of Snow Dome uh, located. This is Mount Olympus here. And so there's this really nice plateau here that makes a really good surface for us to be able to study um, the deposition of absorbing impurities here. And so um, uh, Ian Delaney, my student Ian Delaney was with us. Mackenzie Skiles came along um, with their field spectrometer. And then we had Dan Dixon also helping with the drilling. And so here's a picture of Mackenzie uh, making her spectral albedo measurements. And originally we had intended to do transects across Snow Dome, but the, um, the atmospheric conditions weren't very conducive for us to do that. So instead we ended up with a number of point measurements. And I'll back up. Actually, I guess I, I can't back up so easily. We'll get back to it. It's okay. Okay, go back one more then. 
Um, one thing that I want to point out here is, is if you just look at the surface, I mean, anyone that's done much observational work, this isn't any, anything new to you, but um, there's a lot of spatial um, heterogeneity here. So, you know, whether or not you're looking at a plot here versus a plot here, you're going to get very different results. So, um, th this is something important to do is characterize the spatial variability. Okay, so in addition to making the surface albedo measurements, this is what the side of snow dome looks like. And what you can see here is really, really nice layering. And you get um, these dark impurity layers that are from the summer. And then you get the winter accumulation where you have much cleaner snow. Um, so we brought our ice core, um, I've got a solar powered ice core drill, and so we went in um, with the goal of being able to drill down and capture at least of the f of a few of the years um, in order to look at the interannual variability of the deposition of these impurities. Um, so here we, we were drilling at night, here's Ian making measurements on a core, and then this is when we hit the layer from 2011. And um, this, I, I've done a lot of ice core drilling in many regions around the world, and this um, was a really, really high impurity layer that I was not expecting to see out at the site. Um, so these are the results from Mackenzie Skiles' um, spectral albedo measurements. And so there's a couple things to point out here. Um, the first is that well, we've got spectral albedo here and wavelengths down here. Um, these, bold, uh, these bold traces here are measurements that I'm going to show um, in, a, in another slide in a second that shows what the black carbon and dust concentrations that we measured were for these particular traces. And then another thing important to notice with this is that there's a pretty wide range. I mean, I, I mentioned that you see this heterogeneity, but these albedo measurements are starting to capture this, that that you know, depending upon where you take your measurement, that you can get a pretty wide spread um, in what the deposition of the impurities are looking like. So they're really getting deposited. There's a lot of small scale processes that are affecting where those get captured on the surface of the snow. Um, so our methods for actually looking at how much black carbon and dust Ooh, we're running late. Okay, black carbon and dust. Um, we kept the, fro the samples frozen until just prior to analysis, so we had those flown off uh, snow dome and returned frozen to our lab. Um, the samples were sonicated for 15 minutes and, we, um, and stirred during analysis. Um, we measured them for black carbon. Um, we were, they were nebulized using a SeaTac nebulizer. Um, Shuka Schwartz has a, a poster tomorrow that goes into, um, will address some of the uncertainties in using um, this particular nebulizer. It doesn't nebulize well for particles above 500 nanometers. So the concentrations I'm reporting here are specific to um, basically in the 80 to 90 nanometer range up to about 500 nanometers. And then we've corrected the concentrations for losses in the nebulizer based on AquaDAG standards. Okay. Okay, and then dust. I've got dust in quotes here because um, the dust is determined. Um, this is just the mass of impurities that we're filtering when we use a 0.45 micrometer millipore filter. Um, so that's not specific only to dust. There's um, got to be some organic material mixed up in there also. Um, so this is, this is what the results from two of the locations where we collected, um, the, where we had albedo measurements made. And so black carbon concentrations, a, regu a relatively clean pot with, plot was 19 micrograms per liter. Uh, dust was 27 milligrams per liter, so that's about a thousand-fold difference. Um, for the dirtier plot, you can see the concentrations here where the relative amount of black carbon to dust was greater for the dirty plot compared to the clean. And if we look at the albedo retrievals from here, um, once again, these are those two traces in red. You can see the lower albedo measured where we have the higher black carbon and dust concentrations. And then we've also um, modeled this using Mark Flanner's Snicker model. And for the clean snow, we see pretty good agreement between uh, the modeled and the measured albedo um, based on these impurity loads. Whereas for the dirtier sample, this isn't the case. Um, one issue is probably that the, we can see here that probably the snow grains were actually larger. Um, uh, than, what we, than what we calculated for this site. And then also there's probably um, a fair bit of difference in the optical properties for the dust compared to what we have input into the model. Um, so this is, this is the result of the ice core then. So once again, we were trying to drill dr down. Um, due to the high accumulations, uh, the accumulation rates at the site, we were only able to get the 2012 and the 2011 summer. And 
Um, so what you see here is the surface samples. Once again, um, those are almost cut off here, but these cover a pretty large range right there. And then we have a snow pit, and then we've got this shallow ice core. And so these, were, these uh, go up to August, so they aren't accounting for the additional deposition and increase in concentration that would happen during consolidation under melt. Um, so we would have two more months, October and, well, September, October, and into early November before we would have the first snowfall. If we were able to go back in early November, we would have seen these levels being pushed up. Then we see very low concentrations in the winter snowpack. And then this is the 2011 summer. And I was really surprised. I've, um, of the measurements I've done in the Himalaya, this is on, on par with the highest concentrations that I've measured there. And this is not what I was expecting at all to see at Snow Dome. Here, once again, you can see this particular piece of ice that had extremely high concentration. And so right now I've been doing, um, I, I'm basically trying to figure out where all of this is coming from. Um, certainly some of it's consolidation, but there would have to be um, substantial amounts of dry deposition occurring, and this wouldn't be a background type level. I think that we're probably getting a lot more deposition from local shipping, uh, ocean shipping traffic than I expected. Okay, so, so to summarize, these results are really specific to black carbon. Um, black carbon in this region is really low during the winter time. I think it's, it's largely just diluted because the snow accumulation rates are so high. Um, what we observe, and I didn't show this result so much, but Ian will have this tomorrow, that once we have melt conditions starting to occur, we get a real increase in concentration. So uh, in the springtime, we start to get the potential to accelerate melt. Um, we have the highest concentrations in the summer. So this is due to consolidation, dry deposition, and then we also have increased grain size. And this is important also because this is the period of time when we have the greatest uh, irradiance. So the ability for this to accelerate melt is also greatest in the summertime. Um, the regions that are, that are going to be most impacted in the Pacific Northwest are going to be the regions that have snow and glaciers during the months where this matters the most. So during, um, during July, August, September, and that's going to be these high elevation regions. Um, so it's important because where these are located, um, this is going to reduce the albedo, accelerate melt, and for the glaciers, this could really rapidly contribute to their demise as it's really going to rise the ELA. Um, so right now, just to finish up, we're doing some work comparing the SP2 with the sunset thermal optical method, and we see ballpark about the same concentrations. Um, we have more work to do in terms of characterizing the dust. Um, we really need to look at the absorptive characteristics of that dust so that we can start to partition the relative contribution of the dust versus the BC. And then lastly, what ultimately the place we want to get to with this research is integrating these findings um, with the results from the other sites we've been working on to be able to start to assess the impacts of absorbing impurities on melt and climate in this region. Okay, great. Thank you, Susan. So don't run away any of our speakers. So we have a, a um, what do we have, about eight minutes. There we have seven minutes until the next talk because that uh, nine o'clock talk was withdrawn. So if, if there are any questions for our speakers, uh, feel free to ask them now since we didn't allow questions. Yeah, please. He's up here. Sure. The question was whether we see a similar vertical profile of black carbon as measured. Is that? Uh, forcing oh, forcing efficiency. Yes, actually, I can show that. Um, we see in a clear sky atmosphere, we see about a, I'm sorry, in an all sky with clouds, we see about a, I want to say about a threefold increase in forcing efficiency between the lowest and the, and the highest layer. Um, I'm not sure how that compares with observations. Is that is that similar? Yeah. 
The yeah, question is whether you might see more an altitudinal dependence in, in forcing efficiency. Here we see the top of atmosphere forcing. There's identical mass of soot in each of these cases. And so per unit mass, we get about half of a watt. Um, uh, so for equal masses, we see about a threefold increase going up to 227 millibars compared with 993 millibars. Um, and that's why here we normalize this, the temperature response to the forcing and then also to the mass here. Um, In the back. So Susan, that's for you. Roger. Yes. No. Yes. Agreed. Steve. I'd direct that at Susan.
Okay, so I think we're there at 9.15, and we can get back on schedule. All right, so next up, Cody Routson from the University of Arizona. All right, so you are on the Mac. Okay. That's your mouse. There's your pointer. It's going to run 13 until uh, it goes yellow, and then starts counting down in two minutes. Okay, and we'll try to stay on the 15. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the, the conveners of this session, and um, thank you all for coming. This is a, a new area for me, and so I'm really excited to present today and kind of hear from you all. Um, my background is more in kind of tree rings and climate, so I'm really excited to hear back from input from you all. Uh, just a brief outline what we're going to talk about briefly state our kind of research question, goals, objectives, go into some geochemical and some grain size methods that we're using to reconstruct us, and check out some preliminary records and interpretations. I think the, the context for this talk has already been really well established by the previous speakers, but just to reiterate, dust in this region is really important for both changing the, the amount of total runoff and shifting that peak runoff earlier, Painter et al. This is Painter et al.'s work. Um, so our goal with this study is to characterize the natural variability of this system. How has dustiness changed back in time with aridity, with these big droughts we know have occurred in the southwest? So our study site is in the South San Juan Mountains, right over here. And more work by Painter has shown the storm paths um, coming across the Colorado Plateau region of a lot of disturbed desert soils and depositing large amounts of dust in, this, in the San Juan Mountains. And some previous work that's been done in this region to reconstruct dustiness on um, my Neff et al. 2008. There, this is a time on the y-axis, um, a log scale from present to 10,000 years ago. Um, they're showing a big increase in, these are uh, elemental accumulation rates. We have carbon, calcium, magnesium um, associated about just over 100 years ago, probably associated with the increase in grazing animals and livestock in the southwest. And so we go to Fish Lake right here, and this is an image from Google Maps. You can see all the dust that's just accumulated on the snow around this lake. And so we hiked to this lake. We took sediment cores out of it. The, the local materials, uh, it's a volcanic tuff. It's the San Juan volcanic field. The drainage area in this lake, it's about one square kilometer. And about four miles away, we went to a different lake. This is Blue Lake, a little lower elevation, but a smaller drainage area. It's about uh, one quarter square kilometer of drainage area. So we took sediment cores from that lake as well, brought those back to the lab. And these are our age models we used to constrain the timing of the sedimentation, led to 10 dates on the top, radiocarbon dates through time, and then the black, the black line is the, uh, the model that we use. And so the first method we're using to reconstruct dustiness is evaluating grain size. And so we went out on the snow surface last spring and collected a bunch of dust and looked at the grain size distribution of that, and that's in the, the circles here, the red circles. And fine grain sizes on the right, coarse on the left, and these two lines here are our lakes, the, the grain size distribution of Fish Lake in the little diamonds and Blue Lake in the little squares. And one difference here is that Fish Lake with a larger drainage area has more coarse grains than does Blue Lake. Um, when I show my next time series plots, we're looking at the grain sizes, there's a little vertical dashed line here, we're looking at the, the grain sizes in this, this region um, to the right of that dashed line. And so if we look at this through, through time, this is Blue Lake on the top, Fish Lake on the bottom. These are short cores from the same lakes. Um, the, the offset here is just because they're in different places in the lake and you have fractional um, distri um, distribution of grain sizes as you get farther out from your shore. If we just compare these on top of each other, we can see Fish Lake and Blue Lake have pretty strong co-variability all the way up until about 
1300, 1400 AD, and then they start to diverge. I'm not sure what's causing this. We're re-running, re-retreating and running some measurements from these cores. Um, but right now, this is what we're working with, and I'll kind of return to these later on in the talk. So the next method we're using is using uh, microscanning XRF to characterize the geochemistry of dust and local rock. And so if we look at um, our dust in red and rock in blue, and these are frequency and XRF counts on the y-axis, basically what we're showing is that titanium concentrations, using this method in our rock and our dust, pretty much the same. You can't distinguish between them. Um, same thing with potassium. You can't really distinguish between dust and local rock. With calcium, however, there seems to be a lot more calcium in our local rock than in our dust. And we have really good counts here as well. Um, with strontium, we do have some separation, but the counts are really low, and XRF data are very kind of inherently noisy, so we haven't been able to use strontium as of yet successfully. If we look in this in a kind of a scatter plot, we can see our dust in our little red blob, our local rock in the blue, and our sediment is in the green. And first off, what we notice is that the counts in the sediment are shifted kind of lower in all cases because our sediment is kind of diluted by a lot of organic matter, and it's also embedded in an epoxy resin in order to run it. And so we have to adjust to the mean counts of the sediment up, basically, so you can see here, sediment's lower. We've shifted it up and to the right, and so we can use our dust as one end member and our rock as another end member and kind of calculate the fraction of dust in our sediment between these two end members. Um, another thing to notice here is that Fish Lake, this is Fish Lake on the bottom and Blue Lake on the top. Fish Lake has a lot more of the, the bigger drainage area, a lot more dis, uh, dispersion toward the, toward the rock. And so we can use just a very simple kind of geochemical mixing model. And there are multiple ways to do this, which I've tried. This is just the most simple method, kind of using elemental ratios of our sediment, our rock, and our dust to calculate the fraction of dust. And we can apply that down core through time. And this is what we get for Fish Lake and for Blue Lake. And again, these data are pretty, pretty noisy. And so the next step, what we do is kind of combine all of our different methods. So we have our grain size method in red, our kind of mixing model approach in, in black, and we have our short cores and our long cores, and we can com combine all these. I'm using the, uh, the median just because there's a lot of outliers in our, in our uh, XRF data. So if we combine those together, we can get a, an independent um, record of dust from Fish Lake and from Blue Lake. And we can look at those on top of each other in the top here, again, fish lakes in red, blue lakes in black. And we're doing pretty well, especially with the lower frequencies. Um, again, these are two separate lakes, two different age models, and kind of two independent interpretations of the same, same feature. Um, there are some discrepancies. For example, right here at the end of the, uh, the medieval period between the lakes, there's some little discrepancy there, a little bit of discrepancies during the modern. Um, and back toward the bottom of the Blue Lake core as well. So if we go back to our original spreadsheet with all those different um, indicators, grain size, um, and XRF, short cores and long cores, and we combine them all together into one single time series, that's what we get here in the bottom. And we can see that during the modern period, we do have a big kind of spike in dustiness. It's kind of dropping off to the present. I'm not sure what's driving that. It kind of increases to about 1950. We have a period of lower dustiness. Um, again, the, the drop-off in the modern is there's some discrepancy between our lakes. Fish Lake doesn't really drop back off where Blue Lake does. Um, so a lower concentration here during the uh, post-medieval period. Looks like increased dustiness um, during our medieval period, kind of roughly 800 to 1300, 1400 AD, period of low dust. And then we have a steady increase in dust back in time. Now these peaks back here, they're about the same height as our modern. And so we can compare this with some regional, some regional records. Um, these are OSL dates on sand dune kind of migration. Um, basically, 
recording sand dune activity in Great Sand Dunes National Park. That's four minute L2006, that's in the blue. And then in the Great Plains, these are loose dates in the squares, and the circles are again sand dunes. Um, you now at all 2007, and what they're showing is an increase in sand dune activity, especially during this medieval period, and we have an increase in uh, sand dune and loess activity in the Great Plains, and back here during what we're seeing is a, at least a dustier or drier time. Um, we can compare this with some regional tree ring records. This is a bristlecone pine record we made a couple years ago about 13 miles away from our lake. It's mostly recording a spring precipitation, so it's not annual. Um, I flipped that over, so dry is up, smoothed it with a 50, 50 or cubic smoothing spline, and then this one here is tree ring reconstructed PDSI from the southwest. And again, I flipped that over and smoothed it um, with a, the 50 or cubic smoothing spline. Um, what shows up most dramatically are the low periods of dustiness here and here are associated with generally wet periods um, in our tree ring records. And I should point out right now that this, our dust record, isn't necessarily independent of precipitation. A decline in our record could either be driven by a decline in dustiness or by increased um, terrigenous input from around the lake. And so that could be driving some of the co-variability we're seeing here. Um, these are the medieval mega droughts here. Um, they could be associated with increased dustiness. The age control on our record at that time period, um, plus or minus 50 years or so. Um, so it's kind of hard to say if that peak right there corresponds with the great drought or not. Um, it's shifted a little bit. We can, and I think that's pretty much it in terms of my, uh, my conclusions. Um, we've generated a, a 3,000 year plus long dust record using kind of multiple indicators and in multiple lakes. Um, dustiness and aridity tend to co-vary. We have this recent increase in dust. Um, it could be, un it's probably not unprecedented based on our record, but hard to say. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank all the people who've helped me in the field and in the lab and with ideas. And if you guys have any questions. And we do have time for questions. Annie. Um, you showed the nest plots right at the beginning, and those are ones that we frequently cite in our work that have a really, really low level of dust and a big shoot. And when I look at the plots you just showed, and maybe it's, maybe it's just the nature of the plot or the scale issue, but it looks like there wasn't just a really low background level for a while and a big upshoot in the 1800s, which we commonly cite in our work. Well, it's, it's a slightly different story, and that may be for a couple of reasons. We do see that kind of big increase in dustiness toward the end. Um, as you're saying, it's not as big as what Neff is seeing. There could be a couple reasons for that. Um, first of all, it could be a local source kind of input um, changing the way our record looks with respect to that record, or those re records are also lakes as well, and so they could also have a local source. Um, we're using kind of a mixing model approach, whereas they're just looking at... Um, if I recall correctly, looking at elemental accumulation rates and sedimentation rates, so the methodologies are also different. Um, but again, I think we need to dive into this further to figure out what's, what's driving that discrepancy. That's a really good point. Yeah, that's a really good point, and I've thought a lot about that. Um, the, the main kind of stumbling block I've come across is that precipitation is not only potentially driving kind of the increased runoff, but wetter time periods are going to inherently have less dust. So it's, there's some uh, covariability that's going to be really hard to separate out. All right. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Cody. 
we get the right one? I can't give you the other one. <laughs> this is the more recent one. Oh, that's their fault. Whatever. <laughs> Okay, next up, Jeff Deems. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for the lead-in talk. Covered some of my, uh, my background there, so maybe I can zoom through some more of this. Um, yes. Is that the one? So uh, I'm going to give you some uh, overview of some of the work that we've been doing um, recently looking at hydrologic impacts of dust deposition on snowpacks in the upper Colorado basin, um, some of our full upper basin work, um, and then zooming in a bit at some subcatchments to try to look at, at smaller catchment response to these same forcings. Um, a whole host of folks involved with this, uh, including the folks up here on the stage, so I want to acknowledge everybody and thanks for putting the session together. A uh, great pick by Chris Landry that you've, many of you have probably seen before showing some of the extreme dust in 2009 in the San Juan Mountains in southwestern Colorado. Uh, we've been studying the, uh, the impacts of these regional dust, uh, regionally sourced dust events uh, on snowpack accumulation and melt dynamics. Um, we know the regional sources from satellite observations, back trajectory modeling, uh, particle size distributions, and, and some mineral, mineralogic work. Uh, we also experience them firsthand. They tend to come in in rather apocalyptic fashion sometimes. Uh, here's a shot from Silverton uh, in the San Juan Mountains on April 3rd, 09, um, and up near Aspen on the same date. So these dust storms frequently uh, uh, deposit mass over a large portion, if not the whole, whole upper Colorado River Basin. Um, pretty, uh, pretty large spatial extent to these. Uh, here's the following day showing several uh, previous dust events in the snowpack. Uh, again, this is, this is springtime, so these, uh, these dust events are up high in the snowpack. They will melt out early uh, and coalesce on the snow surface, producing a, a rather dark, dusty snow surface. Um, uh, the work of, uh, of Tom and Mackenzie and Annie and others uh, have clearly demonstrated the radio of impact uh, spectrally of um, both the primary impacts of dust on snow albedo and, and two secondary impacts, uh, primarily in the visible, and therefore our eyes are doing a pretty good job of showing us what's going on out there just looking at the snow. Here's some of Mackenzie's work looking at point impacts um, of dust on snow melt uh, using a point snow melt model from the from date of peak accumulation. Uh, and she's showed uh, a range of on the order of 25 to 50 days early meltout uh, at this site in southwestern Colorado. Uh, clearly, that's a, a pretty big forcing. We see that uh, observationally as well. Here's 2009, the Beartown Snow Tail in the upper Rio Grande uh, in 2009, where we had a near peak average peak SWE, or near average peak SWE at the right point in time, uh, according to the average curve. Uh, and resulted in the earliest melt out on record. So those enhanced melt rates um, really do manifest in the, in the observational record. With our 2010 paper, we decided to look at how that impact might uh, extrapolate to the entire upper basin and what effect that might have on river flows at Lee's Ferry. We created some dust scenarios based on observations of snow albedo decay. Um, and showed that we're currently experiencing a three-week earlier peak, a steeper rising limb on the hydrograph, and about 5% less annual runoff uh, due to uh, the current dusty conditions relative to a, a cleaner, um, uh, what we've been characterizing as pre-settlement uh, dust conditions. 5% less runoff is a big deal in the Colorado River Basin. Uh, that's twice what Las Vegas gets annually. Uh, and it's half of our treaty obligation to Mexico. So in this over-allocated and stressed system, that's a, that could be a big deal. Um, recent work also uh, by some of our collaborators has shown that dust emission is likely to increase uh, under climate warming uh, due to vegetation and drought dynamics. Uh, so a natural follow-on question to our previous work is, is how might increased dust um, and climate warming together affect Colorado River runoff. I should point, uh, I should meant to point out on the last slide that that, that 2010 paper was using a, 
snow albedo decay curve based on observations from 2005 through 2008 prior to uh, the really dusty years that we saw in 2009 and 10. Uh, so what we've done to follow on is to develop another albedo decay scenario based on 2009-2010 um, that has a much faster melt season decay and, and lower allowed minimum albedo. Um, actually required a different equation formulation to achieve that. Um, and that matches our observations fairly well. And we've convolved that with some climate scenarios, bracketing uh, potential future response through a delta method approach uh, with uh, SRES a B1 and A2 scenarios um, and an average response from, uh, from a, uh, a number of climate models uh, centered over the Colorado River Basin. The red and blue curves are from our previous work. The black curve is what we're calling the extreme dust scenario. Uh, and we see in this hydrograph at Lee's Ferry, um, the bottom end of the upper Colorado River Basin, uh, an equivalent shift uh, or advance of snowmelt timing of about another 21 days uh, to the peak from the current red moderate dust conditions uh, or current as exemplified by 2005 through 2008. Um, we also see a slight additional decrease in total annual runoff yield uh, on the order of about 1%, and that's compared to the 5% of the earlier, um, earlier work. So I think what's going on there is we're shifting the snow melt into the cool season, uh, the cooler early spring, uh, where there's just not as much evaporative demand, which is the primary driver of that 5% loss in the other scenarios. If we throw the climate warming scenarios on there, the shaded regions represent the, um, the area bracketed by the B1 and A2 scenarios, A2 being much hotter. Um, here's for 2050 under the three different dust scenarios, and we see um, further um, reductions in overall flow uh, and further early shift in timing. Um, and here's with 2100. And just from this sensitivity analysis, we're seeing sensitivities that our, our dust scenarios are equivalent to about three degrees uh, climate warming as far as a direct impact. Um, I say that more as just a, a means of correlation there. I don't, there's, there's a lot more to tease out with those. Um, so we, we see only 1% under the current historic climate change with our, uh, in total, runoff, total annual runoff with the more extreme dust scenario. Um, however, that sensitivity uh, to dust tends to go down under the climate scenarios. And the climate scenarios really are affecting the snow snowpack accumulation so strongly that uh, additional dust melting in the springtime seems to have less impact um, on uh, evaporative losses. So we see a reduction in sensitivity to, um, to dust impacts um, in total annual yield under the, the hotter climate. Um, scenarios. However, the sensitivity to, uh, of runoff timing to dust impact uh, remains quite strong under all, um, all climate scenarios. Uh, from a water management perspective, obviously total volume is important, but runoff timing is important as well. Uh, we can't store all of the snowpack water in reservoirs, uh, so the longer we can keep it up in the mountains, the better off we are during the hot, dry season. Um, so zooming in on some subcatchments, uh, we decided to look at, at smaller basin response um, in a, a stakeholder-driven investigation. Basically, we had uh, at the Western Water Assessment, we had some of our stakeholders come to us and say, hey, what's going on with some of these extreme years uh, that we're having trouble um, managing our water supplies and the, the forecasts from the CBRFC are providing less guidance than they used to. Um, so we're zooming in on four subcatchments uh, in the upper Colorado basin. Um, and we're using the DHSVM model instead of the VIC model. They're cousins. They share um, a large component of the snowmelt physics and the hydrology physics. The DHSVM runs on much higher resolution. Here's the four basins, Boulder Creek uh, above Boulder, Colorado on the uh, eastern slope, um, Fish Creek in the Yampa River up near Steamboat, the Uncompagre. Uh, river above Ridgeway, where we have uh, done a lot of the in situ um, energy balance monitoring work, and the Snake River uh, above Dillon. Uh, you can see I 70 over there. So, 
the, the snow water equivalent curves, and these are averaged over um, the 10-year model period from 2000 to 2011. Um, this is the average response of snow water equivalent. And we see similar patterns. I didn't show you the sweet curves from the, the full upper basin modeling, but they look largely the same. Uh, and that is the primary impact of the dust scenarios is in the melt season. Um, we see a, an earlier end to the accumulation season, so melt starts earlier and at a, at a lower peak SWE, and we see earlier melt out. Interestingly, at the smaller basin scale, we see a mixed melt rate response in that in two of the basins, Boulder Creek and the Uncompagre River, uh, when we move to the cleaner dust scenario, we actually run the peak SWE date later in the year uh, when the season's hotter, and we actually see faster melt rates out of that than we do from the moderate dust scenario, more akin to the extreme dust scenario, which, which occurs earlier in the season. Um, that's an interesting preliminary result. We'll be digging in, into that some more. Another thing I should point out is that these results were for the past decade. The results from the VIC study were an 88-year run, and I was showing average results from that. So we could be seeing some artifacts of, um, of the period of record that we're using here. Stream flow results from the same basins. Um, again, similar timing influence as in the full upper basin. Um, very sensitive in terms of timing to, to the dust forcing. Um, we see a mixed total snowmelt runoff result um, in that in, in, uh, with more dust, we're actually seeing a little bit more runoff uh, in the smaller basins. The sensitivities, though, we're seeing, or the changes we're seeing in yield are pretty small overall, so I hesitate to to uh, make too much of a stand on, on, on the, not only the runoff volume, but even the sign of that change. Um, the one exception there is the Uncompagre River, where we see pretty dramatic changes. Um, and you'll notice the uh, summer season runoff pattern in the Uncompagre is quite different than the other basins, where we see a, a large fraction of the total annual flow uh, come from summer precip. So there's a little bit different annual total dynamics going on there, which um, which could result in those different numbers. Um, the change in yields are also quite uh, small relative to the interannual variability. Um, so actually seeing a, uh, a change in runoff signal in observed records is going to be nigh on impossible in, uh, in the streamflow record uh, if, the, if the sensitivities really are on the order of 1% in these small basins. Um, and again, we could be seeing an artifact of um, of just the years that we're using. So uh, our, our future work is going to be to, to tease some of that out. Uh, in summary, we see uh, the extreme dust scenario in the, up, in the full upper basin using the VIC model uh, moves melt earlier um, uh, on the, about the same order of magnitude as the clean to moderate dust scenarios, but it moves it into the cooler season so we see uh, less evaporative losses uh, between the moderate and extreme dust. Um, you throw the climate on top of it, climate warming on top of it, we see earlier snow melt from dust, we see lower snow accumulations overall, um, and the runoff timing retains sensitivity under all future climates, whereas uh, the change in runoff, total runoff volume um, is less sensitive to dust in future climate scenarios. Zooming in using the, the higher res model, uh, we see uh, similar to the full upper basin, a strong influence on both snow water equivalent and runoff timing. Um, from the dust scenarios, but as, uh, as we stand right now, seeing a, a mixed result in terms of melt rate impacts and total yield impacts. Um, so uh, the comparison to these two studies leads us to some questions going forward. Uh, we need to dig into the model physics um, some more and see if the different responses at the catchment versus full basin scale are uh, due to some model idiosyncrasies there or differences in physics, uh, or whether there is a resolution or scale impact going on here. Um, uh, we plan to look at how basin terrain geometry and vegetation influence response. Um, we're looking at, at um, coincident impacts with a pine beetle infestation uh, in these subcatchments, um, and as I mentioned, explore the, the effects of the different model time periods. Thanks. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Next is Kelly Gleason from Oregon State University. Let's see. No. 
that's your mouse. That's your pointer. Thirteen before it turns yellow, okay. and then it starts counting the two minutes down. Okay. All right. Good morning. Firstly, thank you very much for having me here. It's really an honor to be part of this session. Well-known warming trends persist across the western U.S. while simultaneously snowpacks are declining. Winter snowpack is a critical hydrologic resource in this region where most of the annual precipitation is stored as snow. Fish, forests, and people all rely on snowmelt volume and the timing of snowmelt. Wildfires have increased in concert with declining snowpacks in the western U.S. and particularly with the observed earlier disappearance of snow. Westerling and others demonstrated that wildfire frequency is greater in early spring snowmelt years, particularly at the high elevations. Warming atmospheric temperatures increase fire frequency and decrease snowpack volume and duration through multiple feedback interactions, but in ways you might not expect. It is not well understood how forest fire affects snow volume and duration by darkening the snow albedo and whether this has significant eco-hydrologic impacts at the watershed scale. Canopy sloughing in an unburned forest has been shown to lower snow surface albedo, while radiative heating in snow through dust and soot deposition has been shown to water, have watershed scale consequences, particularly in the date of earlier snow disappearance. Our objective was to understand similar processes so we asked, after a forest fire, how do structural changes as well as sloughing of the burn canopy lower snow albedo, prime the snowpack to absorb increases in incoming solar radiation, and change snow accumulation and melt dynamics? Our laboratory to investigate this phenomenon is in the high Cascade Mountains of western Oregon, the head, at the headwaters of a major tributary to the Willamette River. In September of 2011, the Shadow Lake Fire burned 42 square kilometers of subalpine mixed conifer forest, predominantly in the Mount Washington wilderness. We've installed two adjacent research sites, one representing a high severity burned forest and a nearby control unburned forest. As is evident in these pictures of the unburned and burned forests, there were large structural changes as a result of the high severity, moderate to high severity, Shadow Lake fire. However, the burned forest is a very messy place where soot, bark, needles, and wood, collectively what we call burned woody debris, a form of light absorbing impurity, but usually much larger. This falls from the remaining canopy and standing tree trunks onto the snow surface. So in order to understand how the burn forest environment changes snow albedo, accumulation, and melt dynamics, we collected hemispherical photos to capture the change in canopy structure. We measured spectral albedo in the burned and unburned forests using an ASDFR. We conducted regular snow course transects throughout the winter through one kilometer of the burned and unburned forests where we measured snow depth, snow water equivalent, and conducted snow, or collected snow samples from a half meter square area. Um, these snow samples were then melted, filtered, and weighed to determine concentration of debris on the snowpack surface by mass. Um, these snow samples were uh, retained also for um, measurement of spectral albedo of the debris. Hemispherical image analysis shows the unburned control forest was moderately dense with a 52% canopy closure, whereas the, un or the burned forest uh, was reduced to just a 20% canopy cover. In the, uh, in the burned forest, there was less canopy to intercept falling snow, so we expected from previous work that more of the snow may accumulate on the snowpack. However, there's also much greater incoming solar radiation as a result of the forest fire increasing energy available for melt. 
Incoming solar radiation in the unburned control forest was about 65% of that in the open burned forest. Insulation in the unburned forest was more variable due to shading from trees in the low winter sun angle. Spectral measurements of the snowpack surface demonstrated an approximate 50% reduction in snow albedo in the burned forest compared to the nearby unburned forest. The burned forest snow albedo was flat across the visible and some of the near infrared, indicative of the black burned material on its surface. This lowered snow albedo in the burned forest resulted in more incoming solar radiation absorbed by the snowpack than in the nearby control unburned forest. Uh, using a simple back of the envelope calculation, if the burned forest snowpack receives 35% more insulation and has 50% lower surface albedo of 40% as opposed to 60%, this means that the snow in the burned forest could absorb almost three times more solar radiation. That's 540 watts per meter square at solar noon in April, as opposed to about 200 watts per meter square in the unburned forest, a big difference. We think the variability um, you can see here in the burned forest snow albedo is due to the mixed severity of the burn and related spatial variability of partially combusted materials falling onto the snow surface. The snow course transects revealed that more snow accumulated in the open burned forest than in the nearby unburned control forest, as we expected. This deeper, darker snowpack melted off faster and earlier in the year. The snowmelt rate was over two times faster in the burned forest during the ablation period. Uh, the date of snow disappearance was 23 days earlier than in the nearby unburned forest. Uh, interesting result from these data is that the burn forest began melting uh, near the first spike in maximum daytime temperatures, you can see right here, whereas um, in the unburned forest, the snowpack did not substantially melt until the minimum nighttime temperatures warmed above freezing, you can see right here. Analysis of snow samples revealed that debris concentration on the snow surface increased throughout the ablation period in both burned and unburned forests by over an order of magnitude. However, the burned woody debris was over three times more concentrated by mass than the debris from the unburned forest composed mostly of lichens and forest dust. Reflectance measurements of the sampled debris showed that the burned woody debris had a dark flat spectra characteristic of burned carbon, whereas the debris from the unburned forest had a brighter spectra, much like vegetation. The debris sampled later in the ablation period when material was more concentrated at the snow surface had lower reflectance spectra in both the burned and the unburned forests. The local forcing to snowmelt due to snow albedo reduction after a forest fire could have grand ecohydrologic implications when compounded across a burned watershed. We wondered how much of the western U.S. could be experiencing this post-fire albedo effect. So we conducted a preliminary spatial analysis using products from the MODIS satellite for the entire period of record, which goes back to 2000, to determine the area of snowy headwaters potentially impacted by the post-fire albedo effect. This analysis demonstrated that al although over 95% of fires in the west intersected the seasonal snow zone, only a fifth of the west is forested. That's the area shown in green. So overall, 65% of burned area in the western U.S. intersected both forests with a density greater than 20% and the seasonal snow zone. These are the fires shown in red on this map. Just over 23,200 kilometers squared of forest fires have burned in the seasonal snow zone since 2000. This so may be a small area across the West as a whole. It's about the size of New Jersey, to me, a small state, but potentially significant to the ecology and hydrology within the burned watershed itself. 
Of these fires, 48% of the forest fire area in the seasonal snow zone burned in the Columbia River Basin of the Pacific Northwest. So in conclusion, burned forests melt snow faster because of the post-fire albedo effect. In the burned forest of this study, snow albedo was reduced by 50%. Snow accumulation was greater, but melted faster and earlier in spring. This is probably due to the greater concentration of burned woody debris on the snowpack surface. This post-fire snow albedo effect is a west-wide phenomenon that requires more research to parameterize the darkening of the snowpack after a forest fire and to understand the watershed scale hydrologic implications to headwater catchments. And with plenty of time, I'd like to give a special thanks to the National Science Foundation for supporting this research. Thank you very much. Let's see, Steve had his hand up first. Certainly. Um, certainly looks brighter. If you remove a dark canopy, uh, particularly in the ablation period, and the snow is exposed, it's definitely much brighter and may have an overall cooling effect at, on a broader scale. However, at the, the local scale, the darkened snowpack does melt off earlier and, um, yeah. <laughs> Mark. Mark, you were a close second. Very similar question. Mm -hmm. What's, what are the relative We expect um, both factors are, are playing into account, yeah. <laughs> So I was asked to repeat the question. Um, he's curious, kind of the duration, I think, post-fire and how long this post-fire albedo effect may be impacting the snow albedo. Um, and we, from our observations, uh, snow albedo is darkened as long as there's material charred in the canopy left to fall and, and darken the snowpack, um, which is a number of years. We expect five to 10 years. Um, in the fires around our site that we're seeing. This is the first year of study and we'll be conducting this research for a number more years to see how it degrades over time. John. Yeah. Can you propose um, mitigation strategies for managing the forest? No. <laughs> I'm pro burn, so I think no. <laughs> I'll leave that to the managers. Annie. Yes. I agree. So, I mean, I think that effect could be, yeah, even more significant. I, I agree. This year we hope to expand uh, the spectral measurements out to many other forest fires in the area that have you know, different degrees of age since fire, but also um, forest structure. It'll be interesting to see how that differs. All right. Great. Thank you. So I just want to uh, 
recognize the two student presentations that we had during this session. Uh, and they were good quality. And, um, and then I also want to appreciate all of the speakers and recognize that we have uh, tomorrow at 1.40, we have uh, a poster session, 16 posters there. Um, and I encourage us to carry this uh, lively discussion into that. So thanks very much, all of you.